I took the time to make some slides for this panel because I think that it's just supportive and it's great. Um, so, and also you can see uh, the games that our panelists made and have a bit more of an idea of um, uh, what they're doing, where they're coming from. And, um, and um, yeah, so we're gonna dive into a virus subject in this panel. Um, uh, hopefully you're gonna learn uh, one thing or two. So, um, yeah, hi guys. <laughs> Hello. How Hello. are you? Hello. All right, all right, cool. Excited. Is this working? Can share with hold? Yeah, okay, yeah, it does. Oh, I'm in business now. There you go. <laughs> all all right. right. So, um, um, so yeah, let's just take a minute first and uh, introduce uh, all of you. So, um, uh, I'll let you go maybe from uh, John to Miguel to TV, and, uh, uh, and then we can move on with the, with, the, with the first question in the panel. Okay, my name is John Middleton. I'm the uh, CEO and founder of. Uh, Nifty Games. We specialize in sports games for mobile, mobile first sports. Uh, partnered with the NBA, NFL, uh, each player association, and um, make clash style head to head sports games. So that's, uh, that's the total goal. Been in, been in the games business since uh, mid 90s. So I've done <laughs> pretty much everything in and around games from hardware to middleware to you know, in-game advertising, merchandising, and now uh, free-to-play mobile. Here we are. And, and, and NBA Clash was a um, uh, game of the day recently on the Apple Store. It was. Yeah, it's really it was, cool. It was a glorious day. <laughs> and at the stroke of midnight, they shut it off. Congrats on that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like, I looked. Huh? Yeah. It's like, yeah, when all of a sudden it was teenage, you know, Ninja Turtles at midnight, <laughs> killing me. Very cool. Actually, looking at the video, it looks very nice. Uh, I have to try it now. Really nice. All right, thank you. Uh, so yeah, Miguel, Miguel Tomas. Um, I've been working in the industry for about 12, 13 years now. Time passes. I work as director of development for First Light Games. Uh, we make a battle royale game, top-down shooter, um, working with Quantum for a couple of years now. I'm quite excited uh, using their tech. Uh, our game, uh, it's on running on the Polygon chain, so we jumped on the Web3 wagon. We've seen very interesting results, so we can also tell a bit about that for everyone who's interested or already out of the wipe, the, the hype, sorry for my English. And yeah, i excited to answer questions and know what happens <laughs> before. Hi hey guys, uh, my name is Tibi, I'm uh, the uh, developer of Tibit, and I say the developer because I'm the sole developer, but I'm helped by uh, two very professional head of product, not here present, and our very lovely uh, application security engineer here. Uh, we have only one product, so I'm pretty new to the industry. I've been uh, publishing mobile games for just over three years now, with uh, Bloody Bastards being our only product. and. Um, I just wanted to uh, switch things up a little bit um, with this game. It's uh, physics-based. Uh, it doesn't have any animations. It's uh, very sandbox-like, but also want to bring some progression to it as well, where you get a lot of uh, items. And um, uh, yeah, I guess we'll have more time. To get into it, it I think this one has like, death. It's like 60 million. <laughs> Installs? How many install is that? I wish. Uh, so iOS called Sandwich is probably around 15 now. Yeah, 15 million install all organic. Yeah, 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 that's, uh, right. yeah that's, that's the thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> impressive. Yeah. No UA, no, uh, uh, rather, maybe so, a little bit of a right. dabbling in UA at some point, but uh, nothing to write so, home about. So as you might have understand is that we have Three different, completely different type of teams here, yeah. right? So that and, and people I, love to stab people. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, you know, that's medieval times. Uh, cool. All right. So uh, let's move on. So, um, um, so let's start at the beginning. So multiplayer, if we go back in time, ten years, five years, or even like one year ago, uh, was not that much present in the mobile industry, and now uh, it's leading all the chart, as I was saying earlier. Um, so. How do you feel like to uh, jump on the bang wagon, let's say, <laughs> of uh, building multiplayer games for mobile? Um, and, and how do you feel like your production is going? And how, um, 
how do you feel in general regarding like uh, creating multiplayer games today? How it is for you? I can go first on that. I've been actually making multiplayer games throughout most of my career. Um, the value in the beginning where mobile, I've been working with mobile and mobile, you didn't quite require that multiplayer tendency because content was uh, asynchronous most of the times and you could kind of give uh, content on update monthly basis. Now, as games become more social, more needed of beating my friends, even in some places, getting new girlfriends uh, and boyfriends, it kind of makes it more appealing and with the, the, the new tech is also evolving a lot. Servers are becoming more cheap, technologies like quantum appearing. It becomes almost fundamental needs scope of the development to make multiplayer, which for techies like me, it's super cool, and I love that kind of games. And, and Arnie from Superscale said World of Warcraft was his favorite game, so is mine, so makes, oh, okay, so I want to make some, like every guy after school, I want to make an MMO. Uh, thank God I moved that idea out of myself. But if you want to make a game today, almost you need to think about multiplayer in some scope, and the need of synchronous and competitive becomes almost fundamental. So that's kind of yeah, I agree. I think, you know, from my standpoint, it's a competition. It's tried and tested, and it's, it's uh, as you alluded to, it's been in, in games now for a long time. You know, uh, for mobile, it's been relatively new, but completely, uh, I'd say it's a prerequisite to some degree as far as uh, gameplay goes because you want to make sure that you can uh, build enough community and have enough competition uh, so that the fun you know kind of uh, gets hyper accelerated and, and keeps people interested longer and it's uh, helpful for not only uh, gaining players but keeping them around you know retention 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 and I think uh, you have to have multiplayer and <laughs> in some ways the more the more the merrier yeah, definitely second that. So first off, Bloody Bastards was completely an experiment from my side. It was just single player, maybe not crappy old engine, I can say that now. And just people came to me, the players, and asked for multiplayer. They can play with their friends, so I had to research it and kind of reverse engineer how I could actually, you know, sync physics, because that's always fun to have, like, synchronized yeah. <laughs> physics across, uh, especially when it's peer-to-peer, -peer. it wasn't fun. but. Um, I uh, second what you said with uh, definitely health retention because I could see like all action games with trails off very quickly after the first, after day seven, it's practically non existent. But ever since multiplayer has uh, come to the mix with the items as well, which are unlockable in the ranks system and uh, each people that, yeah. something to uh, definitely aim for, but also uh, just, just pure fun of it, I guess. It's uh, it definitely. Doubled the retention basically overnight. Yeah, well, with your game too, I thought he said he said peer to peer, but I thought he said, I thought he said spear to spear, <laughs> <laughs> which would have been good. <laughs> spear to spear is a great. That'd be, but uh, yeah, one, one thing that, 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 that. Uh, the <laughs> players went through also in the past like um, three years, well, actually everyone is is we all went through COVID where uh, everyone was at home and uh, multiplayer games were the exit for um, many people out there to share emotions and have fun. And um, so, uh, obviously on our side at Photon, we saw a huge increase in user base uh, in all the multiplayer games that we have. Um, so, like, it's very hard to convey emotions not in real time, like, um, um, or in a single player game. Indeed, uh, but I also can say for probably many people that are listening that I get, uh, actually adds very interesting business cases into, in two sides where we literally saw a single player and the multiplayer was very minimalistic to grow 15 to 20 percent retention uh, uh, revenue in LTV, and it was already a very profitable game. And even for people that are thinking about every studio that's starting now and looking at pitch decks and going to investors, it's a very, I want to say, interesting selling point, but almost fundamental. If you think about in that scope, you know that it's a long driving LTV, a long driving retention, or potential for that, and investors do love that, because investors love money, and who doesn't? So sell the money and you sell your pitch. 
Um, so that creates a the, there's all, everything is a downside. So it's more tech heavy, it's more tech demanding. Just get a nice techie that loves to develop, helps you a lot. Let him nerd in the corner, don't feed him until he does it. Uh, but uh, helps to uh, achieve the results. But the results are more upscale than if you don't. Let's, let's move to the next subject. So um, boosting retention, right? So that, that's why some of you are here. Um, so multiplayer uh, brings plans, uh, brings replays, uh, brings that you look at someone else play to learn how they play. Uh, it brings mul multiple elements that you um, can only sometimes reach with a streamer. Um, so how do you feel like, um, what are you, what would be your go-to or your must-have in the multiplayer game to make sure that your organic downloads stays and convert and uh, how multiplayer can help with that? Yeah, I mean, I can, from, from a sports standpoint for us, uh, Nifty Games, you know, uh, bringing multiplayer in as compared to, you know, if we were to use bots or something like that, that you know, to compete against, is, it's like totally essential because you have to have the element of... Uh, Real human competition and, and uh, the agency that a player brings into the into the fold uh, when you're going head to head, or, or even if it's a two v two or something like that, uh, it adds so much kind of eclectic, uh, you know, on the spot gameplay that you have to have that. You know, it can't be predictable. It can't be, you know, like you're playing a you know a platformer from you know, 1997 or something. It's got to be way more uh, dynamic. And that's what that's what uh, that's what multiplayer brings, and I think it's just, it's totally essential in any kind of uh, situation where there's uh, competition or where there's a uh, ongoing uh, benefit to the player to have elements of surprise, even if it's in a story-based aspect. I think it still works. Yeah, it, and also important to notice is what is your audience. One thing I found out. Is the more casual your audience is, more cooperative they'll be entertained from. Um, features, whereas we were talking about guilds, but is more how to support and connect to players, more players, creates more engagements. And, re and if you put monetization around, that engagement is very, very uh, fulfilling. If your game is more competitive users, this can be even divided between male audience and female audience. The, the multiplayer is essential, you cannot do it all the way around. And following on the things on the bots, as a starting point for studios, one thing we did and we seeing a great value is think on the scale of players and how deep they go in your player base. The players when they start, they don't know your game and they're still very early starters and easy game and for them is hard. Uh, as you have increasing bot difficulty, you create engagement and content for them. You can even increase bots where they have more HP, more damage over time. And you create almost a league system or most progression system that can create the necessity of finding my next challenge on, on what I'm making. And I find that the most interesting aspect on this competitive, and actually Quantum as a bot SDK, very interesting that allows this, you can have different uh, systems, you can even go on a behavior tree or uh, um, uh, goal-oriented scope. We use uh, finite because it's very based on a loop system, uh, so we have hierarchical um, state charts. But coming back to the point, creating that scope of what is the journey of the player from first time playing to playing for one straight month, you have enough content and spending very little time, again, put the developer on the corner, and don't feed him until he makes it, uh, but until he, he, he go, until you execute it till the, in, in the end, but focus on the journey the player can, can, uh, can, can achieve, and multiplayer for this competitive world is very good. Right. Uh, so on top of the competition, I think there's something to be said about also having a strong single player that can not necessarily counteract, but um, 
counterbalance the multiplayer aspect as well. So I think, at least from my side, a good strategy was having unlockable content that you can only unlock in single player, and then mm -hmm. once you get your ass kicked by someone with a lot higher gear, which you can only unlock in single player, then you can come back and uh, kept our overheads pretty low. Sharing my trade secrets here, but uh, it's definitely something uh, that really helped us. And then you can have a lot of content that is unlocked in quite a, I guess, predictable way, but in that it feels right for the players to have that cadence of unlocking things, but it's not behind some paywall or something, but well, it can be removed as, of course, but then they can come back to multiplayer and enact their revenge on yeah. whomever uh, yeah. kicked their I, I think with, with, uh, one key aspect of it is to have multiple game mode, right? Uh, so, it, um, especially in multiplayer games where it's uh, 1v1, uh, where, you know, if you have just one mode, it's often the same rhythm and you like, you can get exhausted, so you, you can go to another mode which is more smooth and then the single player line is obviously a lot smoother yeah. most of the time. Uh, but then if you, um, well, one thing that we can see in the mobile RPG game or mobile action game, or in mobile in general, right, so it's five versus five, right, so, or uh, if you look at Apex and others, where it's three versus uh, others, then you need to be with others, right, you cannot be alone, right, so most of the time you try to be with friends, so it means you're gonna say, hey, at 6 p.m., let's meet up, let's go together and try to improve, and then it's all about communication and skills, and this obviously turns out into having more retention because you are helping your friends and teammates and that makes them better and they want to pay back so they will come back and play again. It's very, very interesting value to humans to share and um, something to exploit, obviously. Yeah, I think it's true. And then with, even within that, there's layers. I mean, from a retention standpoint, like right now we're introducing uh, you know, playoffs and, and, and tournament brackets uh, so that even as you're competing, you know, head-to-head -head multiplayer uh, against one another, then we're also you know, building in a larger forum where it's, you know, uh, 2, 4, 8, 32, 64 uh, teams going against each other within a certain amount of time. And I think that that just keeps, just adds to the competition, right? It's, 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 it's how can you have as much uh, activity during a certain amount of time as possible? And that's what you're after for, for games and gamers. And I like that, like, for yours, with the gamers coming and asking for it, it's, just, it's pretty indicative of the kind of nature of it. You need to be multiplayer. <laughs> it's a gamers, the gamers expected, investors, obviously, you guys are saying that, expected as well. It's just a, it's a prerequisite of, 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 the, of the media at this point to have, you know, multiplayer and, and to be able to, to build community within games and to be able to have competition within games and, uh, whether it's uh, whether it's sports or whether it's RPGs or RTS or MMO or you, you know pick your genre and go all the way down to uh, you know, choices and episodes and you know the, the more the merrier I think is the, the message and I think it's uh, for us it's always been about competition and competition obviously uh, requires uh, more players than one. Cool. Let's move. Uh, let's move on. So. Um so we it touched it a little bit earlier regarding like a production of multiplayer games. So obviously it's it's different uh, regarding uh, UTV. You started single player and added multiplayer afterwards. Um, we see productions that uh, are doing that a lot but failing, <laughs> meaning like they they come with the gameplay and they say, hey, I want to implement multiplayer now. Let's do it, and uh, they just can't because of the way it, the gameplay was built first. The most you know they have to to trash 90% of their code and then restart again. Um, so obviously also your choice of engine uh, will dictate pretty much what is possible, what is not. Um, and then uh, I guess I'm gonna you know, ask the same question as earlier. It's more about like um, finding people who has uh, the know-how and, and uh, how do you um, put that all in place so that you can have like an actual good product and, um, and then iterate and move forward. So how do you tackle that? I can go there. Uh, actually, oh, sorry. I'm still uh, mesmerized by. Yeah, it's actually we're, like we're going somewhere. It's really, this is great. Uh, <laughs> indeed. Uh, so the um, I can, 
I have a theory, and uh, going in many different studios, I work in the past. The engine decision, and we go and then go into multiplayer. The engine decision comes down to your talent pool and where you want to find your products uh, itself. What is the the, the, the product you're trying to build? From personal experience and finding talent on mobile and finding talent in Europe is much easier if you go uh, Unity, and in America it's much easier if you try to find with Unreal. Um, but on the context of multiplayer itself, and uh, agreeing with uh, Mark, you need to build a multiplayer from the beginning because architecture development is, and the system behind it is not the same. Of course, you always can patch it multiplayer inside, but you're going to have more problems than solutions in there. And you have to treat it more as a prototype multiplayer. OK, it's interesting. It, players like it. It works. Now let's remake the game from ground up. In, and in terms of production itself, there's, you are increasing the scope of your game. You can now with the actual specific quantum and, and other uh, tools that are coming out. Um, it's much easier using only client developers, while in the past you need to have a back-end complete engineering team, networking team that could do the entire multiplayer. Right now, we start to have almost entire solutions make, made, not only the uh, netcode part, uh, with tools we can use only client developers. Uh, in the back-end part, you can use tools like Playfab and Firebase, where you have also, you can use almost only client developers, consult with one, one back-end engineer, but it trimmed down the team size before it was 20, now you can go probably with 510. But it's not yet uh, walk in the park. Uh, there's some scope, for example, in quantum, which does a lot and helps a lot. It's a different tech. You have a ramp up page, a ramp up stage, um, which the team needs to adapt. But the difference of hiring 10 developers and hiring five, you see on the end of the month, much the budget is taking. Um, also, but the speed, also you pay initial cost, but then it gets uh, mitigated over time because the, 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 the team and developers are getting this. And also from the previous topic, I see more and more as developers are understanding and getting into multiplayer, the practices, the fundamentals, the architecture uh, needed to support it is becoming more embedded on the day-to-day -day work. Well, I saw in 2017-18 when multiplayer became more and more prominent in the industry, where everything was new and felt like I had senior developers acting and working like junior developers, and now it's becoming easier to work with. So it's a really great evolution that I think studios are trying to contemplate on that team size to support it. Go for it. So, um, for, from a production standpoint, I can only literally speak for myself because uh, um, I've, uh, I mentioned I tried a peer-to-peer -peer solution, so obviously my game is very low scope compared to a lot of other things where you have your, probably your analytics or everything bunched up into one big thing. I use Firebase, but uh, in terms of actual synchronizing what uh, players do, it's uh, focused on Unity networking too, which is great. That's what I'm currently using, and I found it quite easy to extend to use for uh, a great many things, not only just uh, in-game, but uh, in terms of emotes, all sorts of interactions that uh, uh, players can have with each other. But uh, yeah, when it comes to just the production part alone, uh, I'm afraid I'm uh, quite versed in my own stuff, and I'm not sure what applicable things I could say on the topic. <laughs> so I have a question for you. So uh, obviously you are building the same game, so it was single player, and then you had to change your mind to go multiplayer, so w what was your learning path, more or less, like, because um, like, you have to think about lobby, room, joining friends, and all these things, and, you know. <laughs> yes, so I used Playfab first, when it was, I should uh, rewind from the beginning, so at first I did it in Construct, the, the game, uh, if you're familiar with it, it's an HTML5 uh, mm -hmm. game, where you can, uh, I guess, embed an HTML page, and so it's, an unoptimized mess if you do it this way, but uh, uh, I had to basically remake the whole game, so I remade it in Unity, and then I uh, started using Photon mm -hmm. for the multiplayer exclusively. Um, that's a long story short. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we knew from the beginning that we were going to be obviously geared towards multiplayer. And, uh, you know, using Photon uh, Solution, obviously, once you get into building games, and when you, for us, it was really uh, not just a singular game, but a slate of product, um, you know, we knew that uh, looking for uh, best in class kind of um, solutions for any aspect that can help us either save time or save money or build better product or you know, give better experience, we're, we're going to do it. <laughs> it's going to happen every time. And I think, uh, well, we started with you guys pretty early. And, and it worked uh, well right out of the gate. And I think, um, you know, building for a multiplayer is a no brainer. I think it's. Uh, but, but what about NFL Clash? Yeah. Yeah. What about what, NFL what, Clash? So, so, what is your transition <laughs> or your learning from, let's say, NFL Clash to yeah. NBA Clash now? Uh, well, NFL Clash is funny because that that's more of a gameplay learning, I think. It wasn't le it was less about uh, you know, how multiplayer worked and, and more, you know, because. From a technology standpoint, uh, very very similar, but from a gameplay standpoint, you know what we learned a lot about sports gamers, which is interesting that as compared to even other types of gamers that are out there, whether it's RTS, because uh, there's a, there's a lot of that in there as well. Um, having more general control over the situation, more agency for the gamer to to have some input into whether they won or lost the match, uh, was crucial. And in NFL Clash, we lacked that. We lacked that uh, initially. We a lot of that, we've taken it down and retooling now towards, you know, the beauty of sports is there's always another season. So, you know, we'll see where that one goes. We, we you know, additional uh, player control within the game, you know, uh, while maintaining head-to-head -head competition, it's a delicate balance. And then the nature of football, American football, being kind of... Uh, you know, stop start a little bit more strategic than uh, some other types of sports, whereas the ebb and flow of basketball or soccer or ice hockey uh, tend to be a bit more uh, friendly to, to multiplayer. I think uh, we were able to give players more control in basketball, for instance, to have uh, individual NBA players have you know, special abilities that they could then enable and you could then kind of unleash that on your opponent and then they would kind of you know, return serve and, and vice versa use their players against you and you'd have to try to figure out a way to defend and I think uh, that's where we, we, we cracked the nut a little bit and um, you know now that we have yeah, those the, the GUI is much better going. like the GUI is great now we see like the, oh, the UI UX yeah the, the, the GUI and the user experience like um, it, it, it's much easier to use than the, the yeah. previous one Oh, it's, also known, it's also known as game number two. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, one thing I can add is that um, you know, for those who were at the pure stocks before, I was talking about live operation like 10 years ago where there was basically like no stops, like there was nowhere to go to find help to do live game operation, while now there's you know, hundreds of companies that offer that as a service. Multiplayer is sort of at this in the same right now, meaning that uh, there is about five or six shops that can help you to build proper multiplayer games, and they're always like super book. But um, you know, like in three, five years, some you know from now, there's probably going to be more service providers because it's going to help into making uh, production easier. Um, so yeah, we're still in the early age, but uh, there's a lot to learn. Um, so the next is that ex exclusive tech uh, findings. So we've talked about quantum, the engines, and all that, but there's also uh, other uh, technical elements that helps e either into your own production. So, uh, for example, like we see mini production using uh, Miro, Figma, and then um, also in terms of roles, uh, the, the product ownership, uh, they use uh, collaborative tools and uh, how to pump the information from the players into uh, in-game elements. Um, so obviously, you know, tech helps uh, both software and uh, techniques to make things faster. So um, let's go very quick in that. But is there like one thing that really helps you, uh, like, move the needle in your pro in your overall production in terms of uh, technology or software suite? Should I say? If there's nothing, I can move to another subject okay. as well, it's fine. <laughs> it could be, I can dig through my brain and probably find something, but uh, do you mean okay. something specific or a particular piece of software? 
But it can be either, well, either one in either, it's totally fine. Right? Um, I think just the mindset of uh, if you want to synchronize physics, so this is very particular, but if you want to synchronize physics across multiplayer, I think it's best if you synchronize the forces rather than the objects. Oh, that's, yeah, sure. That's one. Yeah, that's that why we build quantum then, right? <laughs> so yeah, it's a full physics engine, right? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, okay. If you use photon unity networking too, then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Emulator. So, uh, so that's one key aspect is that there's multiple ways to build a multiplayer games. Uh, you can just share information using a relay, uh, or you can have the whole engine react to inputs, uh, and then obviously the synchronization is much better and, and more accurate. Um, I'll say one tech finding that I, for us, and been on previous projects is. Um, uh, I'd say analytics is measuring tools. Like, there's always a problem. You always gonna have problems, yeah. and you're gonna have some days big problems. And as if you set up good measuring tools, not only in terms of uh, networking and quantum even provides um, some basic fundamental uh, measurement tools, but build your own too in your pipeline in your uh, live game. Um, and this is not even this is on the tech side that suddenly. Uh, example suddenly in US uh, players are having huge spikes and huge problems and what is that happening we're seeing things happening and was just for a particular reason but you need to measure in many different contexts and measuring tools really really help you to um, tackle the problems quicker and avoid the downfall of a customer service in the future and also having ways that you can, uh, let's say, come down, like one thing we found very good is come down to the game as you were a player, but in the testing mode, so you can also have a measuring tool that you can build on the fly and deploy it. So having ways that you can actively debug, yeah. it's, it's life changer for when the game is live with thousands of players. Uh, don't yeah. underestimate that because when you have a problem, it's going to be a nightmare to get. It's a rabbit hole that you cannot get out. That's what. I yeah, guess. I agree. Just being able to test new features as they come online or new gameplay as it comes online, and then also adding in uh, traffic and the you know uh, the amount of pressure you put on it on, onto your game and it's uh, just general tech backbone is, is a huge asset to have as well that I think you guys provide, which is pretty cool. Um, I know our team's always uh, consistently making sure, a lot of it is, you know, we, we want to uh, test everything and we want to have everything be as, uh, you know, as refined as possible before you unleash it in the wild. So, um, cool, awesome. Uh, next one, uh, multiplayer games risk, okay? So, uh, obviously, um, in any production, there's risk that comes inside, so, um, it does multiplayer uh, make it like um, a more expensive, for example? And then second, um, uh, do you feel like your uh, user base you need to uh, groom them more? And um, if you don't have the the proper onboarding techniques, you might lose them. So where do you see the risk when building a multiplayer game? I think with us, I, you know, uh, it's kind of a tough one to answer because I don't, you know, that risk is what we're after basically. But I think from from my standpoint, uh, any time that there's a situation where you can uh, leave a competition, you know, for us, you know, players dropping or or uh, jumping out of games kind of kills the experience. Any any kind of uh, any tech difficulty obviously would kill it as well. And, and certainly, multiplayer generally and uh, historically has brought larger uh, risk of you know, more troubles basically than than single player but I think that uh, as things become more commoditized and, and companies focus you know specifically on on, on multiplayer and, and uh, synced gameplay it alleviates that a lot and I think uh, so it really comes down to gameplay risks and risks around uh, gamer you know behavior so you know that's community stuff, and it's it's, it's everything from uh, you know uh, 
language all the way down to just dropping out of a game and, and, and you know, another player having a bad experience because, uh, you know, somebody, somebody jumped out. Mm -hmm. So uh, there, there's one element I, I can add to risk uh, in terms of multi production is that, uh, so when we were building Stumble Guys, uh, we were wondering if we should add the option that you can take one of the player and throw them out of the map, right? Just for fun. So, uh, so it was added to the game, and it was a risk to say, well, you know, will all the players exploit that? And in the end, they did, and they find it fun. <laughs> so, so we're like, okay, well, let, let's leave it like that. <laughs> so, um, so uh, gameplay elements sometimes can be surprising, but um, yeah. we should do that. Yeah. Have LeBron James get thrown out? <laughs> get out, right out of the stands would be good. Like Push that. out. It's a good idea. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll follow on that because the, the to re first is the complexity of the game you increase, so you need to increase also your cost, so something we already discussed. But the, the biggest follow on and you're saying is you increase the risk of removing control of yourself and giving to the players for the outcome of the game. If you, have a, if you increase toxicity, it's not something you control, it's the players that bring the toxicity and you creating a fundamental platform for that to exist or for that to rise. There's ways that you can try to mitigate, but you cannot control it fully. So that, I believe, it's the biggest risk is you removing some design control or some scope control of your game that the players have, because it's, you're giving more game to them. They, they are the content, player, multiplayer games, you make players the content, so they make the content for you. And, Creates some um, because there are players that players that are playing against players and they can be sometimes can be fun, sometimes can be really bad. And, and there are examples. Uh, uh, so I can tell this interesting story. There was we put on a game we put a global chat and <laughs> that's courageous. Yeah, we put a global <laughs> chat and we had to turn it down after one day because players starting selling houses, then cars, and we knew. Sooner or later, they're going to start to sell drugs and something else. So we had to turn it down before it became a problem. So see, this is kind of the risks you can increase because you don't control that content. And there's ways to mitigate that. But it was 24 hours, the global chat was down because what can come out of that, we have to stop it. Pick up. No, definitely. I second that uh, having, especially in games with uh, high player-generated content, uh, that's definitely a risk, but at the same time, um, I think it's quite fun. I wouldn't be as brave to give them a chat. They, they want a chat, but I give them a moat instead. <laughs> that would be <laughs> yeah. enough uh, communication for you guys. But uh, definitely they can do stuff with uh, names or any other inputs that they have. They can uh, have a little dance or uh, stuff like that. But coming back to risks, um, I think it boils down to how uh, how comfortable you are with the reward of having the player generated content be a vehicle for just word of mouth in general, like the extrinsically of any type of platform or I guess UA mechanic, just having the UA be IRL between the peeps. I think that's uh, that will be quite risky not having a, um, not having good advertising. Yeah. yeah. It's more risky to not have it, really. To not to not allow for community, to not allow for competition is more risky than, than the risks that come along with it. So I think that's kind of I guess my would be my two cents on that. We used to have a Discord channel but we don't anymore and that's all I'm gonna say about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we never went there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then, but then uh, we just heard the, the talk before where the, he put his three games on the same Discord because it helps him. So I guess it's different from one community to another. And uh, w one thing that we hear a lot, and that same thing we're hearing like 10 years ago, is that, oh, well, 10 years ago was, I don't want to implement live demo operation because I have to pay for some APIs and servers, right? And then now it's like, oh, you don't have, we don't want to implement multiplayer because I'm going to have to pay for some servers. And, but nowadays, everyone's doing live game operation. So, uh, so the risk of uh, cost is actually not there at all. And um, uh, where it, you get it back simply because you make happy players.
Okay, um, so uh, community, so we've touched that a little bit. Uh, so you listen to your community, which is fantastic. Uh, so, but sometimes, as John was saying, uh, you know, there could be a data center somewhere that fails, and then the community comes with a, a pitchfork and a flame torch to you and saying, "Hey, give That's me right. my game." So, um, um, obviously, multiplayer games are way more brutal than any other type of games uh, regarding the community. So, um, yeah, what do you think? What do you, how do you manage that? Yeah, well, you just said it. I mean, you have to have community management, and you have to be able to. Uh, I mean, for us, there's there's uh, two aspects of, of there's kind of the uh, the game community, but then there's also the, the general, like in the case of NBA Clash, you have the NBA community. So there's fandom that goes along with what's going on in the game before they even play the game. So there's uh, it's already some uh, very strong attitudes about you know different players in the game or different. Who should be in the game? Who shouldn't be in the game? You know uh, what? What each gamer's team is, is. You know what their deck is assembled as, for instance. Um, but generally speaking, I, you know I think uh, as long as you monitor your community, you don't don't allow for anything that is, you know, uh, excessive. I think you're you're okay. So I second that again, the monitoring, but uh, that can at least for us create a lot of overhead and it because we're low on staff. Uh, it didn't make sense to focus so much resources on moderating sure. or just creating that type of thing. So definitely, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. But uh, and just in terms of the general uh, toxicity, I think it can mitigate it by making it fun to lose as well for people. Then they don't feel as butthurt, for lack of a better word, when, uh, uh, when it comes to just talks about their who's better, who's, uh, who's uh, worse of uh, a gamer than uh, yeah, players. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, for us, community is a Cause big... Because you, you were at Eno Games before, which yeah, yeah. community is gigantic. Yeah, it's all yeah. 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 Eno Games was... It's they, Eno Games was different. Eno Games was a, was a web-based company, so they pivoted to mobile in 2016, 17, so pivoted very late. And community, when you go on web games, communities like the old times was uh, the, f the PHP forums and all that. Uh, it's fundamental because, and I don't know if it's also part of the game type, uh, but the way we, since then, I've been thinking about it, even the games I've been working, in the cameras I've been working in now, First Light being a, a blockchain game based community creates three fundamental points which are very valuable that I see studios and companies undermine them. One is the most effective organic growth. So we talk about word of mouth. Communities is actually where word of mouth, you bring the most valuable players at zero cost. And it's really, really good in that context if you're thinking about UA. The other one where we see very interesting is uh, I would not say collective development, but in more context, when we we'll, we'll hear other SaaS companies in not in games, is talk with your customers, talk with your customers, understand your customers, and try to learn their problems and figure out solutions. In our case, it's find it, talk with your players and talk. And Discord is very, on on other Discord, all channels, Reddit, talk with your players. You really, really, really see what the problems they have, sometimes you assume problems, you see data to confirm, but talking is completely different. Meeting people on the streets, it's good, it's first time, but there's a lot of value talking with them. And fundamentally, you also can test hypotheses. That's the third point, is testing hypotheses with your players. One thing we're starting to do a lot, and now being in Web3 is, is also different because it's very much, it's still a niche, so it's very community-driven yet, so it's very important for us. So. Everything is new, there's no, like, if you go mobile free to play, so there's no one, so he helps us a lot. Uh, well, so at Fodon, we, we have like a, a mini customers, and then we have multiple in Web3, blockchain, and whatnot. And uh, what I hear often is, uh, uh, well, players slash actors that finds ways to farm uh, tokens and yeah. farm NFTs and whatever. And in the end, they almost have to, um, you know, play the FBI agent and. <laughs> 
and you know play as a, as someone who's trying to to yeah, gather yeah. some resources and then so so uh, do you have a story regarding that or yeah, actually <laughs> I do. Yeah. Uh, so actually okay. very interesting so my name is Miguel and there's a, a bot in America a farmer bot which is they someone in the community to make fun called it Miguel bot um, because he's now always collecting so there's a way and we are seeing actually these farming bots converting between different servers and picking developers' names to pick on us. Uh, we already saw that they come from, uh, most of them are in, based in Russia, uh, Venezuela, and Philippines. So it's literally trying to farm. And they want, basically, it's they trying to get tokens to then sell them so they will make money. But at the same time, community is smarter than, even smarter than us as developers. And they're creating now Discord channels to tag the bots and the names of users on the main Blast Royale channel to say, oh, this is a farming bot, let's not buy from him. So this is a blacklisted from the community. So if you want to buy from him, you must not be part of the community. Most, so this creates also toxicity, but healthy ecosystem, because players always listen to your players. Players know more than you, and they will stop all these things, which is interesting. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I th ours is much more benign, but I think, uh, you know, you get back to what we do with the NFL, and, we, you know, we got a ton of feedback from, from players on based on that game, and, and, and that that was coming in mid-development of the NBA game. You know, we were able to modify it to, to fit, you know, it isn't, it isn't developer, it's not development through consensus or anything like that, but when you hear a strong enough kind of opinion coming from a community in general, and it, and it becomes... Uh, you know, prevalent, then all of a sudden you say, okay, wait a second, let's make sure we're, we're delivering what, what gamers want, not just what we as a game developer, you know, want to do. Yeah. And uh, that, that, that really worked well, and, and frankly, uh, I don't even know how you would go forward in game development without it. It's, it's, a, it's a crucial part of, of the situation to, to hear from your gamers as much as you can, so you know uh, you're trying to make them as happy as possible, keep them around as long as possible. I guess it's the player base that dictate if you want a global chat or not. <laughs> uh, don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, very quickly, like um, a future of multiplayer. So um, uh, yeah, that's one. Hard, it's hard to tackle because like um, I'm being in my seat. But um, um, so obviously, like I've been recommending everyone to go multiplayer. Okay, fine. There's going to be more multiplayer in the future, but. Um, uh, where do you think all of this can evolve in terms of gameplay? So um, uh, there's still like multiple genre is not covered in multiplayer, uh, but um, do you think that it, that multiplayer would be like the foundation of the future of gaming, uh, or it might go even further than that? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I know. Speaking for us, we've got different, uh, you know, for. for Next level multiplayer, I think, uh, in, in competition, you know, for again, getting back to fandom, you know, we're looking at things like uh, geofencing, where you know, it's based on stadium. If you're in the stadium, you can play other people in the stadium, or if you're, you know, it could be, you know, uh, in a McDonald's, it doesn't matter. But, but wherever you are, you know, if you're a, a Celtics fan and, and I'm a Lakers fan, I'm not the other way around, I'm a Celtics fan. Yeah, uh, you know, then you could you could face off and play each other that way. So there's there's a lot of things you can do with multiplayer in combination so location, with other technology. Right? So, so yeah, location based so, yeah. geofencing, uh, anything that, that allows for kind of interaction with the, with real world uh, location and real world activities that uh, the players could then bring in to compete with one another. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and what I see the multi multiplayer, as you said, most fundamental. I, I have no doubt, even now the trend is cross-platform. Um, yeah. And this is going to evolve even more with how the industry is, is going and the, the, some of the, the actions that have been happening. Um, but I would say even more about multiplayer is we'll see, and Photon is doing that pretty well, is um, creating the engine of networking, where multiplayer becomes not more about the questions, what type of game you're making? Well, you're making multiplayer game and there's an engine that already supports. 
We don't care about if it's server authority. We don't care about if it's a simulation based. We don't care about if it's cluster or uh, room based. What you care about is peer to peer. You care is a multiplayer game. And like you make Unity back in the times, you make an engine for cars, for sports, for FPS, for fighting. Now Unity makes everything and Room makes everything. And I believe very soon you have multiplayer that is just database or is just uh, synchronous based. You don't care, you just make a multiplayer game and then you have different modules. And I'm not, I believe it's not, we're not very far from that. Even seeing the evolution in the last five years, uh, it's, and the cross-platform is just going to accelerate. So That's sorry, my... guys, we're going to have to wrap up the panel now because um, time, time's run out now. But, oh. uh, yeah, so I'd love to... Uh, uh, you know, yeah, we can talk forever. Yeah, we can for sure. yeah, we'll I don't want to interrupt too much, to be fair, because there's yeah, a, yeah, yeah. a lot of great there, graphics but, um, there. Okay. Questions? Uh, yeah, we're, <laughs> we're out of time, unfortunately. So okay, okay. Can we give a, a round of applause to our panelists, please? Okay, thank, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.